Alrighty, here we are again. We're trying it a second time, seeing if we can get a little better sound. I don't know why it's so complicated, but it is sometimes. Thank you guys. I appreciate you coming back. <laughs> Alrighty, so how's that? Better? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. So, yeah, I, I guess I am able to use the microphone. There's still just a little bit of stuff that we got to sort out. But, you know, it's always a learning process for all of us. This whole uh, virtual world that we've really become uh, connected to, we're just always trying to give you something a little better. So I'm glad it's working. And thank you for coming back. I appreciate all of you. Okay, so let's go ahead and set up our first part of our design. Anytime that you use any of these right here, this is the Circles on Quilts template, and it's designed to be used with a pin. But you, you can use any of these arcs at any time if you ever wanted to. You don't have to use the pin. There's no rule for that. So I'm just going to lay it on here. This isn't the design I'm going to do, but I just want to show you. I could easily take this curvature right here, and I see that it is long enough to get me from point to point, but you can see it's not very deep, right? I mean, like if we scoot down, we might be able to get a little more depth because these are circles. They tend to be a little shallow when you're just using this much. So right now I'm gonna use it in this space and we're gonna create a boundary area to put another design in. I think that when we frame something with a circle, a circle tends to bring your eye from one point to the rest of the point. It travels all the way around. And I really love that. So I, a lot of times I like to put some kind of a frame on there to help make the design show up. So the size that I'm going to use right now is an 8. So this is the even numbers. You can tell that this is 2, 4, 6, 8. And I'm just going to stitch that boundary and then we'll hop to the middle. Okay, so we can start anywhere. I'll probably start in here. I don't want to be maybe right on that boundary there. As I've said before, if you're going to use this template, it's important that you pick a side, inside or outside. Just pick one, don't use both. The reason that there is a little play is because if there wasn't, as you go around the curve, you run the risk of the foot binding up. So it's better that there's a little room. If it fit just tightly, you could end up with no room to travel and the foot just being trapped. So for this particular template, that's just an important thing to note. That's why they have that little bit of room in there. And it's important that you as the user know that and just select whichever side you prefer. And you can go either direction. So I'll show you what I mean. Like I could sew this way towards this, or I could sew towards the outside. So you'll see here. And then the key is don't sew outside your boundary, just keep within the boundary of the template. Right, so here I would stop. And when you're using this as an arc right now, never push and pull on this. You could torque the fabric in between, which would mean that when you get around to the end, your circle will not look clean. It'll have a little contortion going on. Just go ahead and light pressure and walk it around. Make sure that you're touching. So you can see as I go, I don't really need to rotate my sandwich at all. I just rotate the template. I got really, really light pressure. I find this one pretty easy to use. It doesn't really require a lot of grip or tack or anything. It's just super easy to use. So some people don't even put the grip tapes on it, but I like it. I think the grips, I use them not just to keep the template in place, but also to make sure that this template and the fabric move. So it's kind of like my gloves, if you will. All right, so I'm right back where I started. I'll tack it off 
And then we'll just bring this thread up and we'll get that cut. So that nice light touch is really the key there to making sure that you're gonna get that pretty circle and you're gonna end up closing it right where you left off. All right, love that, isn't that pretty? So yeah, so this can be an arc, you know, this, like I said, we could use that and make different arcs if we needed to. Is that the most convenient use of this template? No, it isn't, and that's okay. But if you needed that shape and that was what you had, would I use it? You bet I would, of course. So you can always use any of these. You know, it doesn't have these super easy placement lines, but that doesn't matter. You can create your own reference lines and your own visual markers that you need in order to do that. So never discount this as an option to create the shapes that you might need if you have this. Because if you have the four piece set, think about how many arcs you actually have, a lot of them. Okay, so let's move on. So this is the one I told you we're gonna use first as far as arcs go. This is the six inch spiral. Absolutely love it. It's super pretty and it's so easy to use. I'm gonna put the card behind it really fast so you can see how it works. This is the foot hook, of course, so we'll put the foot right in there. And you'll see right now I've got grips on both sides because I can curve out this way or I can flip it and I can curve out this way. So this is one of those templates where it's really worth having the grips on both sides. And there's so many amazing designs that it can do. And the way that the lines help you is if I use any of these reference lines, they will get me around 360 evenly. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the middle line right here. This will make, uh, this big one will make eight separations in the 360 and 16 and 32. We don't wanna make 32, we're lazy, we can't do that. So start with my needle right in the center. And we'll just pull up that thread and the way that I like to use this particular design, it's not required that you do it this way, but the reason I like it is I like that I don't have to stitch around the circle. I want a really clean design. So when I hook it on and I line it up, it doesn't matter where I start. I can start here, 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 wherever I want, but all of the next lines will be related to the first line that I stitch. So that's really the key. So for example, like if you just wanted this first line lined right up on this 45, you could do that. You could make it line up with your spacing gauge exactly where you wanna start, just like that. But I don't care, so I'm just gonna pick a spot. We'll just make it super random. Get your fingers up into the shape. We're not holding back here because that's gonna pop up this edge, all right? So put your hand up here, not right at the edge, you know, a finger's width distance, but that's gonna give you the pressure. And I wanna sew this way, so I'm going to be pushing the sandwich opposite of the direction that I wanna go. And I'm gonna stitch out until I touch the line. I'm gonna look in through my little foot hook right there, the little opening, and try to get right to the line. We'll do that, and once I get to that outer area, I'll kind of slow down a little bit so I can really touch it nicely, not overshoot it. Don't let go. Keep everything, hold it, and you're gonna pull back and try to keep that foot right on that line, right in place. So that's really the key. So now I can go, oh, okay, now I need a break, right? Okay, so we said we're gonna use this middle line right here. So now, as I hook this onto the foot, I'm going to line up this middle line right on my existing stitch line. This is that perfect spacing that's going to get me around this design. And because I'm using this stitch back method, hopefully my design will be beautifully clean. Nice and easy. 
right back to the center. I don't have to turn it. I can literally just keep going. I can line it up. I'll do a few without turning it so that you can see how my hand position will be. But if you need me to turn it, just so that you can see, we'll do that after a few turns as well. Carefully trying to touch that outer boundary, but not stitch beyond it. Just like we've talked about with the clamshells, if I were to stitch beyond this line, your eye has a really strong visual connection that this is coming out to the boundary. So if one of your lines goes over the boundary, it's really visible. Your eye will just capture right there. So make sure that you slow down a little bit as you come to here, touch, and then actively change directions to go back the other way. We'll do one more. Now, let's talk about ruler stickers for a second. I am also the queen of messing up sometimes. You guys know that, right? <laughs> you guys have seen that. If I put a little ruler sticker right there that says this is my line, then I'm much less likely to make a mistake and have it aligned incorrectly. So these little bright stickers are so great and so useful. And that is one of our newer products that we've added to that So Steady line. So I got mine so that I could demo them. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> I've used them a lot already. Pink's my favorite color. All right, so again, using our sticker, getting lined up. And you'll see that we can just move the sandwich. We're gonna keep both of our hands working together. Notice that my hands are not one out in front of the other. They're both staying on the same parallel line, okay? So right here, this is my line and my hands are just staying together. Not one out in front, not one behind the other, but keeping them on the same line. And that's really important. If you can work on that, that'll improve your ability to move everything. So I'll let you watch again. So I wanna go this way. So I'm sort of going to push the sandwich back the opposite way. Can you imagine right now if I stopped here and I tried to travel around the circle and I tried to guess how far I had to move in order to get to the next line? Oh, I would hate that. That would drive me crazy. Look at how pretty those are and how nice and clean. And because we double stitched them, they're so vibrant and beautiful. They're gonna look amazing. So we'll go ahead and we'll stitch a few more. We, we do wanna see how it looks. So I could also start skipping. Like if I wanted to have fewer lines, I could use the this fat line. He's the one that's closest to this straight edge. That's gonna give you eight. So that would essentially put one every other for this space. So there's some math involved in this. I don't know the exact degrees, like one of them's 22 and something, and one of them, it's like 360 divided by eight, 360 divided by 16, that's the number of degrees that each of these are oriented so that you can have some really precise spacing as you put the designs in. You can see that each of these spaces are nice and even. And that's because Leonie is really smart and she does a lot of math with her templates and makes them work fabulously. It's a good thing she does the math. If it was me, I don't know where we'd be. I can sew it, but I hate the math part of it. I love the geometry part, but not the math part. No, I like math. Math is fun. Math doesn't change. That's the part I like about it. So would it matter if my stitches got a little off? No. What could I do? If I mess up, I can bond bond time, but let's say that my template shifted, right? So let's, let's play that game. We'll just do it for you right here. Okay, I forgot that I was going to stitch back and I let go. Ugh. Oh, darn it. I messed up. What am I going to do now? How do I get lined back up? Okay, let's do it. We'll get it lined back up. It's not hard. So if you just had to let go or your child just fell and they're screaming for mom or your grandkids are like, come read me a story and then you have to come back later. I'll, I'll show you how we fix that. It's not hard. We have amazing tools that'll help you to do that. So you guys know I got my 
cool spacing gauge, my teal spacing gauge. I love this thing. I can find it almost anywhere. And of course, pink, right? So we're going to use this right here in order to get this line back up. I know that I want the foot hook to sit right there. Okay, I usually use my pinky because that's about the right spacing right there. It's about that perfect size of the foot right there. This right here, I need to be a quarter inch away. So my spacing gauge can be super helpful for getting me there. So I can make some adjustments. Always check a few spaces to make sure that you have the full orientation that you need. Obviously, the foot there is helping us. Take a couple of stitches, just slowly, and see how you're doing. You know, before you start going full speed, double check, am I on the line? Is it getting me where I wanna go? How close am I? If it's off, then maybe you're just one or two stitches instead of the whole line, right? So there, we've lined it back up. It looks awesome. We totally did a good job, no problem. All right, so let's keep going. We got a get our next couple in there. We'll try to do these a little faster. We got a lot of talking, but we have some other stuff we want to show you, so. Nice flat hand position. Notice that I have fingers on the ruler and all near the foot, and my bumper fingers are off. These fingers are telling me what's happening with the fabric, and these fingers are telling me what is happening right here. This way I get sensory information from both features, both areas, because if I'm just holding up here, I might not feel what's happening underneath, okay? So this is a, just a really pretty design. I think it stands alone. It can work really well by itself, but it's also really fun if you do it with just the eight, you can put free motion designs in it and it looks even more exciting. So you can always add to this. There's just no end to what you can do. So you can see it sews up pretty quickly. It's not super complicated. And even if my line isn't perfect, like this one has a slight gap, I think that just adds a little more texture. So I'm good with it. I'm not gonna even try to fix it. I'm just gonna leave it and just let it be what it is. All right, so the, I think we have only one more. So we'll finish that up. And of course, as we said, with this template, if I wanted to, I can create another circle that would spin the opposite direction by flipping the template over to the other side. Okay, but I think that would be way too much for this space, of course, right? But we could just put this like this and see then it would go the opposite way. So, I mean, you can even just put in a few of them. You don't have to do every one. You could just put like four quadrants, split these up, and just do one that goes the opposite way. And that would be even more exciting. We just add a little visual interest to it. With this particular design, we got a million stitches right in the middle. So we're just gonna tack a few more because nobody will ever see them. And then we'll cut that. So I just took a few stitches. I usually use about five um, for any type of tying off. And I moved the fabric. Make sure you move so that you don't have your knot sticking up on the top. All right, we'll cut that. That connects our bobbin thread here on the top. And I think we have like a little, a little baby thread right there. We'll have to pick that out later, but doesn't that look amazing? I think that design is so pretty. That was two templates. So we used our circles on quilts and this was the even number. You could use whatever fits your space. If you want to do this design, I'm gonna give you one caveat, okay? When you lay this on here in order to use this template, I need to make sure that I can reach the edge with it. So if this circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this design has to be able to fit the halfway of that circle. If you're ending up inside like this and you're not gonna touch, then this is probably not the most effective template for this if the circle is bigger. So that's something for you to watch out for. Now, one of the things that is um, kind of a challenge with this is this is a really, really pretty arc, but you can see it kind of flattens out a little bit right here. There's no center line to line this up. So if you wanted to use this as an arc, it's really tall and it's kind of short, like uh, the base right here is short, 
but you could definitely use it. I mean, this is a really pretty arc right here, but then I would make maybe a center reference line in order to use it in a space maybe like this. Like if this was the, the shape that I wanted, I could make a center line here and in the box, and I could line up that arc on those center lines so that the curve is not like too much on one side, you know, where you'd have like a big hump over here and then it would be kind of lanky on here. We would want maybe the curve to be centered in the space. So this would be a way that you could make a little reference mark on here and use this differently. But the primary way that this arc is used is rotational like this, okay? All right, so let's go ahead. We're gonna move on to our next design. And I'm gonna pull up um, a couple of items and we're gonna use this space right here. So we are going to make a stacked arc just in these, this space. It's not two squares. This is just a center mark for a reference, okay? So I'll show you. Here's the space right there. This is what we're gonna try to fill. And let me show you the sample so you can be oriented. It's gonna look like this. This is what we're trying to do. So we're playing with how do we get different stackable arcs like this in a certain space? What does it look like if we need to put these different swags in at different heights? So this one, of course, is very shallow and it has to fit a long distance and then deeper and deeper and deeper, but the base size is the same. So this is what we wanna show you, um, and we're gonna be using several different arcs because some will fit more easily than others. So we're just gonna show you how you can play with that and fudge it. All right, so let's get our first one. So the, the first set of arcs, I'm gonna put a couple of them out here. These are kind of big, all of these are pretty big. This is our arc template set, and you can see there, this one's 12 inches, it's humongous. So let me show you something cool though before we move on. I'm gonna grab my 12 inch arc, and I wanna put it right on here, and look at that. Do you see that this is the same arc right there? This is the 12 inch arc, and this is a 12 inch arc also, but this one is only a little piece of it right? Whereas this is going to give you a continuous, much longer line. So there's sometimes when these bigger arcs are really important because then they don't chop your, your arc up. Okay, so let's see how we put the arcs on here and how we decide what can fit. I'm going to turn it this way so you can see the layout a little bit and maybe we'll try to scoot back just a little bit so you can get a better view. All right, so right now this is the eight inch arc. And this one should fit in this space, but we'd have to go up pretty far. This should be um, eight inches right here, but we'd have to push up the arc quite a bit. So you can see my foot will basically fit right there. So we'll start with that and we'll work uh, some of the bigger and smaller arcs after that. We know that this one will fit because it's eight and this, that's the size of this space. But when I say it will fit, let's look at this for a minute. If this is an eight inch circle, like it, it could be, this is the whole arc, but this would be half, right? So these parts down here are going below the half circle because you can see here they start coming back in, they get narrower as they would if this was a circle. So if I want this to fit, I kind of need to find the widest part. So this has a center line marker and what that'll let me do is line this up right on my center line as best I can. And it looks like uh, my, maybe my space is a little big, so I'm just gonna bring my foot in just a little bit so we can get a, a nice fit. You know, when you mark it, it says eight on the ruler, but it's actually a little bit bigger than that because of the chalk. All right, let's get this bobbin thread up. So I'm just gonna put my foot just a little bit inside because it looks my, like my line is just a little bit bigger. And what am I doing? When I look at it, I'm trying to put the same amount of space for this arc on each side so that it's gonna fit nicely. It's not gonna be, my foot will come in about the same space on the other side. So as I sew this in, I should be the same distance here as I am on the other side 
and this center line is going to be right in the middle. So this is kind of big to hold with one hand. So if you if you look at it, see how wide it is? So what I recommend is kind of maybe making two hands work together and I'll sew up a little bit and then I'm going to reposition my hand. So I'm touching right now on the arc very nicely, foot's right against it. Now, if I tried to sew down this side, I'd be working kind of on this weird angle and that would be really uncomfortable. So I'm just gonna flip it and I'll keep sewing and make sure I have enough pressure with my other hand so I can get right down to the bottom. Okay, so that's really, really deep. How do we get a narrower arc in there and try to get it to the same space? So right now where the needle is, I'm gonna adjust my next arc so that it'll match on the other side as I sew it. So one of the ways I can do that is I can use this arc. This is a 10 inch arc, it'll fit in a bigger space, but if I force it to eight inches and I confine it, I can make it shorter. And here's how I do it. Let's see if we can, again, we, we need a little wider angle there so you can see a little bit more of it. So you can see that this is big, but if I put it on the center line right there and I try to make it so that I have the quarter inch right down here so that it'll fit perfectly. Let's use my space engage, make sure I can get into that correctly. So right here, so what I've done is I've only used a little piece of this arc and you can see even though it's a bigger arc, it's shorter now because we're not allowing the full value of the arc to fit in this space. We're only limiting it to this eight. So you can see it's gonna give us a much narrower arc than you would think. So I'll just hold on to it. So if you're watching, tell me what you see. There's something wrong with this picture and I wanna see if you guys see it. So let me know if you do. So I'll adjust my hand position so I'm a little closer to myself. And we'll get right into that same spot. So this was the 10 inch arc. Anybody see what's wrong? Let's see if I can find anybody who finds it. Good job, sissy, there's no grip tapes. How'd that happen? I don't know. <laughs> this one was in the drawer. No, it's okay. My husband's like, can I help you put some on? He did help me do that today. So you can see here, we have two different arcs and what they give us is they give us different depth just by how we played with it. So it's not that the eight is the only one that can fit or the 10 is the only one that can fit. It's going to give us more or less depth based on how we use it. So you can see that I use both of those arcs perfectly fine, but I'm getting something different with those. So by the same token, if I take my even bigger arc, I have a bigger one, you wanna see it? It's huge. It's the 12 inch arc, and we're gonna use this one a little differently. I can go ahead and I can use this one and put an even narrower arc in there. Let's see, we'll have to, let's see, we'll have to go that way because we want it to line right up on that center. So you can see this one is not gonna give us as big of a gap. So maybe we wanna use something a little different. I wanna try to make these gaps maybe a little bit even. So let's do this. Let's see what we can fit right there. And we'll line up our arc right there. And we're gonna just turn it a little bit so we can get it. We're, we want our foot to be right there. We're just playing right now, we'll see what happens. And then I can try to scoot that over and then we'll just curve into that other one. All right, so how did that do? Did we do good? That one's pretty good. A little flattening right there, but we played with it and we can make that. So the way that you could make this not flat in the middle is what I would do here is I would push the arc up to where I wanted it and mark this part and then you could sew to the end by turning it like this. So you'd basically put a little reference stitch right here, not, not necessarily stitching, but maybe a mark with chalk. And then when you turn this, you could line that up and get you that narrower arc right there. 
So if we want to put this arc up in here that's a little deeper, what can we do with that? How can we do that? So we can, we can put one in there. We're going to put that eight inch in there is we can put that circles on quilts right in the center and get that taller one. So you can see that you can play with a lot of our different arcs in order to give you what you want so that you control the design. So here I would have to tack off a little bit, put this in here. Let me get this a hole right there in that center. All right. I like to just mark that with the pin so that I can know where the pin needs to go. And then I'll feed it up through the bottom. And you can see he's right on that pretty spot. All right, I've moved a bunch of stuff. Let's find my circles on quilts. What did I do with it? Can you see it? It's the one that looks like the fan. There it is, I see it. It's hiding. Okay. All right, so we want the fan to be open so that that can fit in it. So let's see how we did. I think we need one more stitch to get into our eight. There we go. So, and this, this is how we're gonna get that taller arc in there. So you can see that by playing with different arcs, you have so many different options. And what really is changing is the depth of the arc, how deep it is, how tall it is. And that's just something that's really fun to be able to play with. So if you have even just one or two of these different templates, you're gonna have a lot of different options as far as what you're gonna get in your design. So let's tack this off. So I can tell I did some wonky marking because this one was not precisely centered, but that's okay. I'll just go with it for now. So you can see we've got, you know, the different stacks and I bet I have something that I could find that I could fit an arc right in there that would fill that space so that we would get a nice graduation right there. So let's go ahead and we'll pull that pin out. Now we're gonna use a different set of arcs that we have. We've used the really, really big arcs. These ones are the exact same um, style as the four inch arc, the three inch arc, the ones that come with our sampler set. So this one is the four inch arc. You can see it's really cute and small. This is the sampler set one. And this one is the three inch and they're, they're very similar. And I wanted to point out one of the key features about all of these. These are all the same style. What's great about these is I can use this template on either side. See these lines right here? I can use these reference lines and this center line and I can stack my arcs repeatedly going this way or I can stack my arcs going that way. So whichever side that I want to use is going to give me the same arc. And I think it's interesting that it looks so different, but remember that this is an outside curve where the foot is going to the outside of the curve and this one would be considered an inside curve. So there's actually about a half inch difference between both sides. So that's why they look different, but this curve is exactly the same as that one when you sew it out. So that's one of the important things to note about these arc templates. I think they're just really valuable, and then they've got these great reference markings that you can use to make different designs if you're rotating them, okay? Yes, Sandy Gray just asked, is the three inch arc separate? separately available. Every single one of these arcs can be purchased separately. I'm even gonna show you this ridiculously giant one that I have. Let me see if I can grab it. It's so big. It's way back here. Look at, you won't believe how big it is, but it is awesome. So this, this one is 12 right here, that's 12. This one's eight, that one's four. Here's our little three, the baby, so cute. And then this one is 10 right there, and this one is 16, right? It's humongous. This thing is so big. I don't really recommend using those really giant arcs on a domestic machine unless you have a really big throat. 
because they're just so big, it's not as comfortable to manipulate, but I do use that a lot on my long arm. So if you're a long arm user, sometimes you need just something that will span a much larger space. And this has all of those great reference lines plus repeatable lines where you can do, you know, different spacing for larger arcs. So this one is like super happy. Look, he's smiling. Ha! Huh? But this one is, is yeah, harder to do on a domestic just because it's harder to hold. So I would put a bunch of grips on this one if I was going to use it. <laughs> so all of these are available separately. We have a lot of different sizes in that. And you can always choose whichever one you think is going to work best for your project. Okay, so let me show you one more set of tools that we have. And there's... There's two different groups in this. They're the same type of tool, but they're different sizes. So I'll kind of put them like this, and I'm gonna just put them out here, and I'll change my camera a little bit more so you can see them. Okay. You know, I think that we often don't get the chance to for people to see these, but they are really powerful. And so I just wanna show you what options that you have. Again, this set, this collection is really, really big right? So when you look at these arcs, you can see that they're very, very different. I think there's one more right here. Let me grab one more. They look similar, but they're not. They're all different. So you can see this one's pretty flat right there. This is number two. Let me see if we can put them in order. Here we go. One, two, and then this one is they're so big, you can tell. It's kind of hard to get them all in order. But this will help you kind of see the size differential on them. What you get is you get the same length of the curve out here, but each one of these is a little narrower as it goes down. So one is the most narrow, and you can see that it almost kind of looks flat. It's just really, really of a, a shallow curve, very gentle. And then you'll see two. You can obviously see it starts to look a little more curved. I'll just put this behind it. See, you can see that it's, it does have a curve, but it's slight. It's not really deep. And then each time you go up in the number, you're going to get more of the curvature. So four is the widest one, the, the widest curve. So here's number four. You can really see that if you drew a straight line right here, this is the gap right here, and then this is the top of the curve. So this is going to be a much deeper arc over that long span. These curves are called the inside-outside curves, and each one is deeper than the next, and these are 12 inches. So I actually have all of them. There's only four of them. And then I'm just going to grab my other set of them, which is right here. And here, I think you can see the curves on this even a little better just because they're so much shorter. So we'll put the one on the bottom. There's number two, number three, and then there's number four. And with four, you can really see like how deep it is. Look how, how much deeper it is. Just really looks obvious. You can see a really kind of a pointed bit on the end there. What's great about these templates is, again, this inner curve here is going to be the same as the outside. So when you take the time to, to use these, sometimes it's easier for your hand to, to be holding it like this way, but maybe you need to sew that way. Whereas if you flip the arc, that's not going quite how you want it. You don't have the reference. Whereas if I have the arc here, but I want to travel this way, then this will allow me to go either direction. So that's one of the things I love about these inside outside curves. So let's sew a little bit of it. And you can make these fit any space. So we'll start with number four. This is the deepest inside outside curve. And we'll just put a little curvature in there so that you can see how it looks. If I wanted to be super, super precise and accurate, which sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, then I would maybe put a center line and I could line up the template right in the middle. But a lot of times that's not really necessary. I don't need that level of precision. So this is the center line. 
Let's get you in just a little closer so you can see better. There we go. So I would just use the center right now. I'm just going to visually reference it. And as long as I have the quarter inch on this outer side, that tells me that I have the same distance for both sides. So it should be perfect. So this isn't super deep. This is still pretty shallow. It'll get me right into the corner. And let me just explain something about this design right now. Because these curves are shallower, I should be able to not cross over this part. When I line this up and I sew this shape into the corner, I should not at all cross over. Let me see if I can draw this with a pencil so I can show you. Depending on how deep the curve is, like if the curve came up like this, if it crosses the miter line for this box right here, and then I did another one here, you're going to get this overlap. Because these are so shallow and they don't cross the miter right there, you're not going to get any overlap on these arcs. And a lot of times that's, that's what you want. You know, that's just an option. That's a choice for you to note that you will not get that. You're just going to have these cute little arcs that are scalloping around your box. Okay, so keeping your center line in the middle, using your spacing gauge, making sure that your spacing gauge is flush right there, flat against the template. And the very point right there of the plastic is going to go right where you want your needle to go. And then I always like to connect that last one with the spacing gauge because I think that is really going to clean it up. Make sure that your needle gets right exactly where you left off. So we'll look for that middle and we're just really going to be careful about getting ourselves right in at the end of the design. So, and we'll just tack this in a few stitches just so you can see. So this one is number four. This is the widest one of this six inch inside outside curve. And you can see that if we use any of the other ones, they're gonna be much narrower. They're not gonna be very deep, but I think that's cute. I mean, I think that that's pretty. It, it, if there's something in here or you just wanna put a little definition to a pieced square, this is perfect. It's not gonna take over and it's not gonna be like the super deep arc in there, but you know, there are other options. So let's go ahead. We're gonna show you a different option and how that's gonna impact this square if we use something that has a deeper curve on it. So this one is our back to back right there. And you can see this one's really deep. It's really tall. This is a three inch base right here. So this should fit this box. Um, if I drew it nicely, it is a three inch box, but we'll see how good of a ruler work I did drawing it. So you will see that the difference in the arc here is gonna be quite a bit different. It's gonna really take up quite a bit more space. I lied, this is the two and a half, These, this is the three, these are narrower. So this is actually not gonna fit all the way up in there. So we'll have to short it a little bit, but that's okay. I, th I think it's still gonna look amazing. All right, so I'm just gonna line it up to the point where I have that quarter inch right here. So I'm actually pushing him this way because if this is three and this is only two and a half, I have to create enough space so that as I sew in, the foot will touch right there. So I'll use that as my guide and I'm keeping this line parallel to that seam or to the box, right? Because we want to touch right there. So right there, when we do this one, you can see how much deeper this is. And if I line this up, what do you think is going to happen with this next arc right here? Do you think it's going to cross over or what do you think? I think it is. I think it's definitely going to cross over. I can tell because right there, that's not a quarter inch. He's going to sew a little on this side and come around. So you'll see that depending on what arc size that you're using, you're going to get a little different look to the design. 
And so it's not that you can't use what you have. You just have to recognize what's going to happen with different arcs and what shapes they're going to give you. Because this one kind of fits up in there so deeply, you're not going to get very much space right here in the middle. And you are going to get those little overlapping areas for each side. And then we'll do that last one. So you can see they really do kind of take up all of that space right there. So these are design choices for you to make, for you to decide um, how much space do you want your design to take up? How is it gonna look? Is it gonna fit? I kind of like that first one, honestly, I won't lie. But this one is just gonna give you a little different look. You're gonna get a really tall arc in there. You're gonna get this kind of uh, almost an oval tip and this would continue, you know, if we did the next box like that, you're going to get really small spaces in the middle. And this is where most of your openness will be. So it's not that this arc can't fit. It's just going to produce a much different look for you than the first one that we did. So I think that if you want to figure out what those might look like, it would be useful as an exercise for you to make some different size boxes that you think will fit with your... Um, you know, whatever quilt you're working on or something like that, or just do a sample where you test the arcs in different sizes, then what you can do is when you need a specific size, like if you need a four inch or you need a three inch or you need a two inch, then you can look at that sample and you can say, oh, if I use this four inch arc or if I use this four inch inside outside curve, I like that. That's maybe too deep or, or not. Maybe it isn't. I don't know. So this one right here, this is the deep side. This one is the back-to-back 3-3. -three -three. And you can see that, you know, it's got some shallower side. For me, this wouldn't give you much of anything. I, I wouldn't even bother. To me, this is like too narrow. Let me just show you. If we lined this up right here, notice how he wouldn't barely even touch, you know, the line right here. This is a quarter inch. I wouldn't even say that that was worth my time. So I wouldn't even use this. But let me show you one other one. If I use, this is the top of the curve. So this is a three inch curve in a two and a half inch box. And I think this one would fit pretty nicely. So let's get to the corner right there. There we go. And I'll just line him up in the middle and we'll make him touch the corner just so you can see what you're gonna get with this one. This one's gonna be a little deeper than the first one, a little rounder. And I don't think we will get any overlap on this one either. If we do, it might just be a little bit, very little. Yeah, no, it's, it is very small. Enough that I would say it's almost negligible. You know, people will, will say, maybe you just kind of uh, sewed back over it. They won't know that that was intentional, but I think it looks fine. It just adds a little texture right there. But it's a very low volume of that overlap and it's really smooth. So always connecting the dots, making sure that the design connects at the corners the way we want it to. Yeah, so that's gonna give you a lot less of that overlap right there. And this one, this one kind of takes over the space. Like as a quilt design, this one assumes maybe that there's something happening in here. You know, this is a little bit of a frame. Whereas this design definitely is integrated as part of the piecing. It's going to compress really through the center, but it leaves a little center motif more than this. So I, I like this also. By playing with the different arcs that you have, you can see what sizes that you have, what choices that you have. So it's not that if I have a two and a half inch square, I need a two and a half inch arc. It, it really can be many different things. It's just about this depth change that is what matters, what's gonna make a difference for you. Okay, so let's do one more thing. So we showed you this right here and we're gonna show you how we can use one of the different arcs and we can kind of get a similar effect and it's gonna take a little bit of play um, but we don't have the nice foot hook on some of these other ones. So let's get that four inch arc out and we'll use that. So that's a good size, I think, for the space. 
So no, I guess we need the, I guess we'll use the eight. My six inch arc is put away, I don't have it, but that would be a good size for this. What you wanna look at is this would have to span, if we started the foot right there on the line, using this to line it up and we rotate it like this, this one will not fit all the way across easily. Like right there, there's a gap. So you would want something that would easily span whatever the diagonal of your box is. Okay, and then I'll show you how we are gonna manipulate this design. And here we'll use the inside. I think that'll be super convenient. What do you think, should we try it? We can use the spacing gauge between each one and that's how we'll decide how far we're gonna travel. So that'll be a, a good exercise for us to use the spacing gauge as well. I'm gonna put one more mark on here. I'm gonna make a little reference dot for the foot, okay? It can be anywhere. This curve is symmetrical. It's not changing along the, its length, but we just need somewhere where we can say, okay, this is where we're gonna start. We could also use our um, ruler, but I don't want the sticker to go off the edge. So, so right here, as I rotate, I'm gonna keep my foot touching right in that spot. And let's see if we can mark our box a little better so you can see. So this is the boundary. So as we sew, we're gonna keep inside this boundary. So we can keep the foot touching right at that arc and we'll just sew the first one. And we'll do it the same way. We're gonna sew out and touch the boundary and we'll sew back right to there. We're gonna be rotating it by keeping the foot in the same spot, and we'll use that spacing gauge to give us whatever spacing we want. We can do an inch. What an inch would give us is that as this sews, it's going to be a three quarter inch spacing. It won't be one inch because the foot will take up part of that space. Touch your boundary and come back. So you could see that any of the arcs have the potential to do something like this. And the key to making them look good is making sure that you have that starting reference spot and that you can get back to that easily so that you have that nice clean line. And we'll just keep rotating. We'll use that one inch spacer as we get around the corner, we might have to fudge just a little bit so that we can uh, change it because it'll be on the top there between the next one. I think this would be really great to do with a big shooting star at the point. I think it would look cool. So here we're going to cross over, as I said. We're kind of touching right there at this corner and that'll still give us that space but we're going to end up being up on the top here touch the line and back down to our start point and then we'll just keep going i'm going to adjust my sandwich a little bit he's catching on the end there so we kind of want a little space. So I'm gonna fudge it just a little bit because we don't, if we do it from this end right here, we're not gonna get anything. See that? I know this is not the space I want. I kind of want that. So we're just gonna play with it a little bit. Touch. Now let's talk about what happens right now. I could probably put a little baby right in there. There's enough room in terms of space, but I would have to stitch up the line and then position the ruler to do that. And I don't know that it's worth it. I don't. I think this is really small and nobody's gonna see that there's a big gap or anything like that. So I think I'll just leave that how it is. But if you wanted to put additional lines in or if you had a bigger space and this was noticeable, you could sew up the boundary or you could even jump stitch up to the boundary and then you'd line up your template and you'd sew that part that is up above right there. So that would be how you could complete that if you felt like this 
was missing something right there. So that's just another idea. So any of those arcs can be used in this way and that's just another option for you. All right, and then of course, I won't show you the obvious one, but you know, arcs can also be stacked, of course, and that's something that's really fun. Um, let's see if we have enough space so we can maybe do one of those. We'll try to demo at least one of them. All right, and then we'll be done. All right. So we have a couple of boxes right here. So I'll put a stack right in these two. In order to keep the arcs nicely stacked up, I want to make a center line. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that real quick. Let me get my straight edge and we can just mark the center. So we said that this space right here is three inches. So we'll mark it at one and a half. And hopefully that'll be close enough to the middle for us. So we'll just do two of the, the boxes just to give us a little room to travel. And what I'll do is as we use that arc, I'll use both sides so you can see how we could work with either side. So again, when we're choosing size, right here, if I lay this on here, I want to make sure that this will cross over this boundary. So let's see if we got our little one, our smaller one. Can you see that little three inch one there? It's just like the one that I have, but it's really tiny. It looks like this. Oh, you found it. Great job. Thank you. So I'll show you, if I put this on here, even though this is a three inch opening, we don't want this. We don't want the piece so small that we can't travel using these travel boundaries. So when we do the four inch arc, he's wide enough that he goes outside of there. He'll get us to the seam and then we'll move up the seam that way. So we'll use that four inch arc for this one. We'll do it this way so you can see more easily. We'll just start right here at the boundary. All right, and right here, I don't have a lot of space right there, you know, as far as being able to line this up. I could line it up like this. And see how the foot's kind of on the outside right there? He's really, really not fully seated. So I think it would be smarter, easier. This has grips on both sides. I don't know why. <laughs> I usually put bigger grips on there, so I'm not sure why they're like that. But we'll just start going across. We'll go to the boundary, and we have it lined up right on the center. And we can travel however far that we want. If we look at this, each one of these lines, of course, is the quarter inch. If I just use this edge of the template, then the foot is gonna space it at a quarter inch. So let's go ahead and we'll use two spaces and that'll give us a three quarter inch spacing. So I would line it up like this, using this same reference line, I'm gonna put one of these curvy lines on that. I'll keep it lined up right on the center line, just how we have it through the middle. So it looks like we went a little too far. Let's, let's just scoot up. I guess we'll do one inch, but I traveled way too far. You see that? So make sure you come back, make sure the foot is touching and I'll get my finger up in the curve. So now, I can look right here and I can see this is how far I need to travel. So I, I had gone too far before, but I can use my finger as an estimate. So it's, it's one finger space about. So as I go up, I can use a ruler for travel if I want to, but I don't have to. So about that space, let's see how we did. We're using three lines, so it looks like we need about two more stitches. And your estimation will get better as you do it more. So make sure your ruler is touching and then we'll just cross over. 
right to the white line. And you can even use this to just pull and move you up the line. And then you can estimate and just line yourself right up on that next space. Let's kind of scoot you in just a little so we can see a little bit better how we're lining that up. All right, so we're lined up right on that. This is one, two, three, the third line down, and that's gonna give us that one inch spacing. So my foot is not quite touching, so I wanna make sure it is. And then I can do my arc. Touch my boundary, and then I can just sew right up the line a little bit at a time using that visual estimate right here. So right there, I'm almost touching, but not quite, so I'll come back one stitch. With this design, I would probably want to clean up my stitch boundary as I go. You know, when I'm all done with the design, I'll do that um, ditch around it with the spacing gauge to clean it up just because I think it will need it. That'll help make everything look a little neater, a little cleaner. Ooh, I didn't do very good on that one. There we go. So we can use the spacing gauge as we go around and we'll get all of those lines cleaned up. So I love this design. I think this design is really powerful and really fun. And it's even more fun, you can fill every other one. Like if you felt comfortable doing some free motion or even just some straight line fills, you can use your ruler. Um, Denise, I'll show you how to clean it up. Let's go ahead and do that since you asked. So always, always, always spacing gauge is awesome. <laughs> I love it. So let me get my straight edge out. Okay, and here I should be right in, in that line. That's where we stopped. And I can use this and double check it. If the line is wonky, like, cause I didn't use a ruler, you can even maybe add a little texture a little at a time like this and go back and forth a couple of times. That'll put a little bit more thread down there and it'll kind of capture any areas that are not clean. And it, it'll also straighten them up because you're using the ruler. So we'll just put another little bit there. And this thread is pretty heavy. This is a 40 weight, so this will definitely help clean that up. If I was in the ditch, then I would just hide it with a narrow thread. You know, if you're stitching in the ditch, you wouldn't be seeing this anyway, so. But if it was visible and you wanted to clean it up, you can just go back and forth a couple of times. If you're using that ruler, it's gonna be a nice straight line. It's gonna make it really pretty. And then we'll get right to this transition point. And the same thing here, then we would just, we don't have to rotate our sandwich. We can just line it up with the spacing gauge. And then we can do a little bit of that same thing. Put a little extra thread in there. Kind of covers all ills. So many times with this, we have some extra stitching, you know, double stitching already. So if we just put in a little more Kind of like covers up all the little challenges. Then it looks really intentional. So I'll go ahead and I'll um, cut it out and then I'll pull it so you can see it. So you saw that it looked kind of wonky, but look at it now. It looks good now. It's all cleaned up. It's all tidied. Let's get you. There you go. That's a little better view. So just put, by putting a, a little bit of extra thread in there, you can really, really clean that up. Yeah, covering all the ills up. Yeah, <laughs> I have to do that sometimes. Uh, so, okay, I'm going to look real quick and just see. I haven't answered that many questions and wanna see if we have any. So if I haven't answered your question, I don't wanna to have to scroll back too far, so ask it again. Why are you using the rulers upside down? Which one's upside down? This one? 
Most of them aren't. I think that four inch one the, had the grips on both sides for some reason. I don't know why. And um, one of them, the grips weren't on it. Like they had the adhesive, but it didn't have any grip. Um, I just set it down, but now they're all mixing together. Yeah, yeah it's this one that's, um, here it is. I see it right there, it's hiding. Okay, so I'm just gonna sh show you. This is Brenda. Brenda, look it, that's not even a grip. So if I used it the correct way like that, there's nothing to hold it right there. So I just, I knew that there were grips on the other side, so I just flipped it over and used them on that side. So that's why it was upside down right there, because the grips are right there on the front. I don't know why. I don't, I don't think I put these on, because I don't usually cut mine this size. So I think this was a, a leftover piece that was left in class, and I had just grabbed it. But if I use it upside down, I knew the grips were going to hold. But right now, there isn't a grip right there, and this one seems kind of a suspect. But usually, I do use them this way. I try to use any ruler this way because the lines are easier to see. So let me grab my little card again. Is that um, right there? Thank you, baby. All right, so let me just show you this real quick. These white lines are etched onto the back. One of the ways that you can tell that this is an actual true and correct product is if you buy a template that looks like this, that says four inch arc, but your lines are black and they're painted on there, that is not our product. That is a counterfeit for sure. Ours are laser etched into the back. If you felt it with your finger, you literally can feel the texture of those lines. And when I lay that against the fabric, I don't get any shadow because there's no light between the fabric and the template. If I use it upside down, which I can, there's no law against that, but you can see right away all those shadows because the lines are up above the fabric. So I do try to use them correctly. And by that, I mean when you can read the words like that, you should be able to read it. An example of when th that doesn't always work would be if we're using, for example, this template that we showed earlier. If I want to curve this way, then I can use it just like this with the words readily visible. But if I want to curve the opposite way like this, then I'm going to be using it upside down. And that's why there's grips on both sides of this template. So. It's important to just know what you want. It's not that you can't use it upside down. It's just that the words are harder. The lines are harder to align. So you can do it. There's no law against that. It's just knowing what, what you're going to get. Okay. All right. So there we go. Let's see. All right. Can you see the block? What block? The back? Oh, D. Yeah. Uh, the back, of course. I always try to, I did check my tension, you know, here, when, when I'm saying I'm going to show you, I'm like, oh, okay, is it good? <laughs> I hope it is. Looks pretty good to me. It looks okay. So I use a different color. I usually put um, something, some other color on the back, just so you can get a little different options of, of different choices. So this one is uh, very complementary to the the blue. This is kind of a orange and yellow, which is a great complementary color with the blue. And then this is a bluish gray, and they're actually the same weight of thread. This is also 40 weight poly, and the front is 40 weight poly. So there's no mismatch with this particular one, but I do often use a thinner thread. I, I often use an 80 weight on the back. I have a lot of 80 weight pre-wound um, bobbins that work terrific that are gray but you can see that this thread has just as much presence as the front it's just going to give it a little cooler look whereas the orange is warmer it kind of this is to me invites you in a little bit more whereas this is like starry night almost you know it's cool kind of a look all right let's see Common size for circles in a circle. Mary Bennett, what is the question? I, I don't quite understand what you're asking me. Can you give me some more words so that I can try to answer your question better? Mary, I made this first full circle. 
Um, if you want to go back into the video and watch it again, I actually used our circle tool. Okay, I used this. And this is an eight inch circle, which was centered sort of in this box right there. This is the middle and I put the pin and I sewed in the channel all the way around. That's how I made the circle. And I specifically made the circle to create a visual entity for these lines. I could make them come all the way out to the box, but I just thought that that was pretty and it, it was the potential to show you that you also have these as arcs that you can use. If you just need some little thing and this will go corner to corner on your box shallowly, but you, but you like that, then these all can be used as arcs in different ways. So if you have this, you have a lot of other options for arcs that may fit whatever you need. Okay, okay, let's see. Full quilt ideas. Oh, so Nini, Nini Graham, I have a book of patterns, but when people say they're looking for full ideas, does that mean that you want an edge-to-edge -edge design where you're repeating the same design? Because typically that, that's a style all of its own. That would be a book of edge-to-edge -edge designs. And I do have a video that uses the fun and fancy template set, and it shows three or four different designs that you can use for edge to edge patterns. But typically if I am going to quilt my own quilt, I don't want to do the same pattern over and over again. I, I, that's just not my preferred. I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I get bored easily. So for me, I want a design that is going to enhance my piecing. So for example, if I have a border, maybe I will use this in the border. If I have some little small, um, squares that need a little detail maybe i will do a double scallop like this on these little squares and maybe if i have a larger open area where i need a big center motif that has its own identity i would do something like this and maybe i would fill in every other one with some microfill or something like that to add a little bit more value and changes in elevation to this especially if this was standing alone on a blank fabric like if this was um, in the center of something and it wasn't a pieced entity, then I would definitely want to fill this in to make this have more visual impact. So whenever people ask me about a book of full designs like that, I mean, it's so difficult to, to give you cohesive book of designs that appeals to everybody. Because you like something, Susie likes something, I like something, Mary likes something, Johnny likes something but a full book of designs that are all cohesive doesn't really have the ability to hit all these different people and meet their needs. So it's better if I can give you some different sizes of designs and different ideas and you can pull what you like and put them together. And, and I know that's not really the answer that you're looking for, but that is really what is true for most people that you would want to try to collaborate a few designs. So like, for example, if, if we're doing arcs and circles, I think all these could work together on the same quilt <coughs> because they have a similar feel. They're all arcs, they're slight curves, you know, type of thing. And then maybe I would add either a straight line fill or some other fill that is a different scale. And then these could all work together on the same quilt. Okay, let's see. Dale Williams, thank you so much for your compliment. Welcome to our broadcast. I'm glad you were able to join us. Space Engage. Um, so somebody just asked, so I'm gonna just pull it up. I don't know what I did with it. Did I, is the Space Engage over there? Yeah, it is hiding. Oh, I've deep. talked about all that in the chat. Oh, they did, okay. There's a little running joke of. Yes, my space is always engaged with this little guy. Love it, he's awesome. So you saw today we used, finally, people always ask me, what are the other pieces of the tool used for? Well, this is the quarter inch finger always used to determine how far away the needle needs to go so that I can, uh, the ruler needs to go so I can position the needle where I want. So for example, if I was right there and my needle was in that position holding everything 
and I wanted to sew an arc right to this spot right there, that space engage gives you that quarter inch so that I can precisely sew right into that spot. But you saw that we used that one inch right here and that gave us a three quarter inch spacing for these lines as we went. So there's many different things that you can do. If you want to be a quarter inch away, I mean an eighth of an inch away, you can use this and then position your ruler and you would be you know, closer, very close by echoing with that one eighth of an inch. So, okay, let's see. All right. On the first design, Marilyn, this first circle right here, this is an eight inch circle. And I used that six inch spiral from the sampler kit, the sampler set or the ruler work kit to do those curves. All right, well, Lucy, I'm excited to see what you do with what you learned today. Glenda, you know, I will do a storage class. I think that it might be a little unrealistic, though, for what I have compared to what most people have. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I have a lot of templates, definitely more than most people because of my teaching uh, requirements. And I usually group them by classes. So, for example, I have all of my circles or things that make circles together. So the mini multi-arc the back to back with the circles go together. Um, if it's a simple circle, a between the line circle, circles on quilts, those all go in one drawer. They're all circle related. And then I have um, my arcs that we showed today and my inside outside curves and my longer arcs, those all go in the drawer together because those are all arcs that can be used for different sizes. So if I know that I'm looking for an arc, I can go to that drawer and I can find the one that is the right size. Um, and I actually have plastic uh, drawers. They're like the, you know, you get it, I don't know, staples or whatever. It's like a filing bin, but the drawers are skinny. When I move to the new studio, I will do a studio tour once I get unpacked. So, all right. Rosemary, thank you. I'm glad you're here too. All right. So, anyway... I won't keep you guys too much longer. Thank you so much for being here. So we've given you kind of a bunch of different designs, ideas for swag, ideas for scallops, ideas for stacked curves. This one is, um, I like to call this kind of like the vanishing point design because they all come back to the center. And then here we just did that vanishing point, but we did the full rotation. So it, it does make it kind of wider. So. Hopefully you enjoyed that and that gave you some opportunities to see some of the different sizes. So Lisa Ryan, I am going to address your question. So Lisa says, it's a shame they don't add the spacing gauge to the beginner set with the ruler foot. So when Leonie West initially created her product, the beginning ruler foot did come with the spacing gauge, but our product has been out since 2005, and this is 2020. So what's happening now is a lot of people already have the ruler foot, and maybe they lost their spacing gauge, or they just want another spacing gauge, or they, they already had it and they just want a foot for a different machine. So what happened is as time went on, we gave you the option to purchase only what you needed. That's why they changed that packaging because a lot of people already had some parts. Now you're not paying for something that you don't need. And what they did is they reduced the cost of the starter foot set by that change. So it used to be that you're paying $55 or whatever your dealer chose to choose, chose to charge. And when they took that out, they reduced that packaging. So you're getting the same value. If you bought that space engaged separately, you're still getting the same value. So that just allows you as the user to choose what is best for you. So, okay. All right. Like I said, oh, I'm going to let you go. I keep talking. Okay. Next week, I will be in the knee deep in boxes and have no sewing space available. So we will not be doing free motion Fridays and we will not be doing any ruler work. 
I am planning the week after that that I will be doing some something. Um, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I will be doing something. And I also will be unveiling more information about my wedding ring quilt along, which is almost ready. So I've been editing the pattern and um, thank you so much for Peggy Anderson has been helping me to review it and get the sewer's eye view on it. And so we'll have that ready and the full picture of the finished quilt hopefully. Um, but as I said, it's very chaotic at the Quinn household. So we never know what's going to happen. And so hopefully you'll bear with me for the next couple weeks as we kind of get our life back in order. But this is our 22nd move. We are a military family and we started out our married life in 1991 and we moved 21 times up to here. And so hopefully, the <laughs> my husband says, yes, this is the last. I hope it is because it's a beautiful house, beautiful studio, and all of our kids are in the same community and really looking forward to settling into our own spot. So, okay, we'll give you the tour when we're ready. Have a great weekend. Happy quilting. Bye, guys.